Air Force Base in California. I'm watching out, out the window, uh, watching the sea and the clouds rush by. It actually gave a, a sense of speed, more so than, um, uh, than when we were up in orbit, uh, being much higher. Uh, I think they were all very relieved because there had been some concern because we had lost some tiles initially on, on the orbit and they didn't know whether we'd lost any on the bottom or not. Flew down over the San Joaquin Valley. We do a big turnaround to land on the, on the lake bed for that first flight. And I remember when John went into a bank, a big left bank, I looked down at the lake bed and there's thousands of people out there on the lake bed. <laughs> John, look at all those folks. Uh, which had come out to see us land. Joe Engel was chased, you hear his voice coming in on final, uh, talking to John Young and, and Crip in, in the airplane that they were right on glide slope, coming in for a landing and then have that landing, and then have John Young do his Young dance. He was just so elated. Uh, it was such a magnificent flying machine uh, to him at that time. The first time I really saw a real shuttle was the Columbia when it was out on the lake bed after the landing and I'm walking around it. I couldn't believe they sent that big a mass up in the air. People really thought this was all impossible. So what we do, what we have done and shown and demonstrated through the shuttle program is we've shown that we can take the impossible and make it possible. Thousands of spectators line up along the landing strip to greet the shuttle and its two-man crew. Anyone who was associated with the program or there just to see the shuttle return, I think felt a lot of pride in our country and our space program. And so uh, that, those emotions were, you know, finally released and you said, wow, you know, the flight was uh, done safely, they're back home, uh, the, the shuttle really does work, it's a great program, it's got a great future ahead of it. Hey, this thing works <laughs> and, uh, and we got it back all in one piece, which is what we wanted to do. While Columbia's return was spectacular, it would renew NASA engineers' worries about the shuttle's thermal protection system. During the post-landing inspection, 148 of the orbiter's tiles were found shattered, and 16 more were missing due to the effects of an overpressure wave. While that and other issues were addressed, the 50-ton Columbia would be placed atop the specially configured 747 and ferried back to Florida and processing for its next mission. It's a massive enterprise. It's over eight stories tall. Uh, sitting on the ground, and uh, it's, you never get over that site. It's really awesome. After the shuttle lands, there's a processing procedure for the shuttle. Post-flighting it, uh, checking the tires, checking the struts, uh, measure, get the right, correct measurements. And then uh, when the shuttle is ready to uh, uh, mate with, with the 747, we would tow underneath, and then they would lower the, the space shuttle down on the supports on top of the aircraft we would take off. <laughs> On takeoffs from the extra long runways of Edwards Air Force Base. The shuttle carrier aircraft's crew of four would soon grow accustomed to the smell of burning rubber. That's the intense heat generated by their plane spinning tires as they carry two massive aircraft at more than 100 miles an hour. The average range of a 747 is about 5,000 miles, but due to its weight, configuration, and special flight requirements, the SCA can travel only 1,000 miles at a time. A full turn in the jet can take several zip codes. 3, 2, 5. Switching up, make it. Cruising at more than 250 miles per hour, the jumbo jet burns 40,000 pounds of fuel per hour. That's 130 pounds per mile, or the length of a football field per gallon. No wonder it has to make several stops before reaching Florida's east coast. We would get a spacecraft back, go over it again, be sure that we could reuse it, repair it where we had to do it. It had never been, never been done before. And so I think that's one of the marvelous things about the space shuttle was we found a way to, to turn this spacecraft around and use it again. Before the end of 1982, Columbia would fly four more missions. Liftoff of America's space shuttle. Including STS-5, the first with a crew of more than two astronauts. Challenger, 
the second orbiter in the shuttle fleet made her maiden flight on April 4th, 1983. And liftoff, liftoff of the Orbiter Challenger and the sixth flight of the space shuttle. STS-6 deployed a communications satellite and featured the first spacewalk of the shuttle era. Just two months later, Shuttle Challenger was back in orbit, this time with the first American woman in space. Physicist Dr. Sally Ride was a member of Commander Bob Crippen's STS-7 group that deployed Canadian and Indonesian satellites during the six-day mission. Challenger was ready for flight in less than two months, another NASA first. Shuttling the first African-American to space, an Air Force combat pilot, Guy Bluford. For me, it was an exciting moment because it was something that I had been training for for 15 to 16 months, and so I was looking forward to the experience of flying in space. We are in an era of brotherhood. We have liftoff, liftoff of Mission 41D, the first flight of the Orbiter Discovery. In 1984 to 86, the newest Orbiter Discovery would fly a record six missions. And liftoff, liftoff of Mission 51D and the seven-member crew of Discovery. Carrying into space satellites, international astronauts, even a U.S. Senator and a Congressman. One year after Discovery's debut, Atlantis flew her first mission. Liftoff, liftoff of Atlantis. A new orbiter joins the shuttle fleet and it has cleared the tower. STS 51J. It was also one of seven classified missions the space shuttle would fly for the Department of Defense. By the end of 1985, the space shuttle program had completed 23 missions, including nine that year alone. Each successful flight had the unattended consequence of convincing some that spaceflight, once considered among humankind's most inherently dangerous endeavors, had become routine. That notion would soon be tragically dispelled. Well, I am so excited to be here. Amid much fanfare, Krista McAuliffe, an elementary school instructor from Concord, New Hampshire, had been chosen from among 11,000 applicants to be NASA's first teacher in space. I would like to humanize the space age by giving a perspective from a non-astronaut because I think the students will look at that and say, this is an ordinary person. This ordinary person is contributing to history, and if they can make that connection, then they're going to get excited about history, they're going to get excited about the future, they're going to get excited about space. The American public's interest in its space program was renewed by her participation and was eager to see her off. Commanding the flight was Dick Scobie. His pilot was Michael Smith. Serving as Challenger's mission specialists are Judy Resnick, Ellison Onizuka, and Ron McNair, Joining McAuliffe as a payload specialist was Greg Jarvis. From the start, STS-51L was plagued by delays, mostly due to unseasonably cold temperatures in Florida. Rather than give pause for thought, the delays only tried the nation's patience. Everyone, it seemed, was itching to go. January 28th, the ground temperature at Launch Pad 39B was a frigid 36 degrees ice could be seen on the launch vehicle. Despite concerns voiced by some, shuttle managers reluctantly decided to press ahead for a late morning liftoff. Six, we have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. Challenger, go with throttle up. At 11.39 Eastern, twice the speed of sound, the Challenger's fuselage breaks apart from the inside out. America's space program suffers its first fatalities in flight. God, no! All seven Challenger crew members perish. Okay, everybody, stay off the telephones. Make sure you maintain all your data. Start pulling it together. We come together today to mourn the loss of seven brave Americans to share the grief that we all feel and perhaps in that sharing to find the strength to bear our sorrow and the courage to look for the seeds of hope. The investigation 
headed by former Secretary of State William Rogers, would fault a solid rocket booster O-ring, rendered defective by the bitter cold. But the Commission's findings also address the human factor, the role played by shuttle program managers in sending Challenger aloft that day. The shuttle program came to a halt. It took more than two and a half years of arduous engineering analysis and painful soul searching before a retooled and reborn shuttle would return to flight. Challenger was tough because it not only represented a breakdown in communications, but it just, it represented everything that's wrong or, or you know, wrong about an agency like, like we are, where segments of the agency weren't talking to each other and didn't know everything that we should know. We thought we knew where all the risks were and, and had them pretty well contained. Uh, the, uh, the solid rocket booster that caused the accident, obviously there was something that had slipped through. Uh, so uh, we went back uh, throughout you know, the complete vehicle, all the systems, and uh, did a complete uh, uh, review and, and trying to uh, find any other things that we may have missed that may be lurking there. When things are really starting to look smooth and you're starting to get maybe overconfident in a way, then it's time for you to step back, think about what you're doing, go back and look, do some additional testing, and see if there's something that, that you really hadn't anticipated that is going on with your system. During a lot of that time, uh, we got a lot of criticism that maybe the agency lost its edge. There were folks inside the agency that started, started losing their confidence thinking maybe we can't do this anymore. Two and a half years later when we flew and then landed that flight, it showed that no, we really can't overcome really, really large problems, really tough technical problems today, just like we could 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 50 years ago. That was, a, that was an important milestone. On September 29, 1988, 975 days after the loss of Challenger and her crew, the orbiter discovered returned six veteran astronauts to space to deploy a tracking and data relay satellite important to a number of NASA missions. STS-26 proved a comeback milestone for the space shuttle and initiated a tradition that survives with the program today. During the flight, we had roses show up in the Mission Control Center. Six roses, five red, one white. And there was a card attached to it, and it simply said, congratulations, return to flight, we wish you well. And it was signed Mark, Terry, and Mackenzie Shelton. Didn't know who they were, but after the flight, we, uh, through the, the floral company, we, we tracked them down so we could send them some pictures and, and something to thank them for sending the roses to Mission Control. So the next flight, roses show up again. And again, it's five roses for the members of the crew and one rose for those who have lost their lives in this endeavor. And so this family, they have become part of our family. And they haven't missed a flight since. Every flight since that time and, and to date, and I suspect they're gonna go right with us to the end of the shuttle program. STS-26 ended on October 3rd, 1988 at Edwards Air Force Base, California. With Discovery's safe landing, on runway 17, the triumphant crew was greeted warmly by Vice President George Bush on behalf of a proud and grateful nation. There's something special about a return to flight that, that makes you, you have some trepidation because you're, it's still fresh in your mind that you're, you're frail and, and you can make mistakes and you're human. In the spring of 1990, the $1.5 billion Hubble Space Telescope was loaded into Space Shuttle Discovery's payload bay and on April 24th was sent aloft to be deployed to Earth orbit on STS-31. Capcom, we have a go for release. Discovery, go for Hubble release. Okay, we have a go for release. As envisioned, Hubble would return never-before-seen images detailing our universe as it was millions upon millions of years before. Soon it would become clear that Hubble pictures were not. Several days later, if not a couple of weeks, we found out after we were back on Earth that it had a problem with its vision. And most of us were just devastated, you know, that here we had this marvelous instrument that we had put on orbit and it was going to be useless. It turned out that it wasn't useless at all because even as with its flaw, it was still a much better telescope than anything that we had, you know, on Earth. A shuttle mission dedicated to the telescope's repair was planned. In essence, Hubble's nearsightedness 
would be corrected with a new pair of glasses. Lift off of the space.